Good afternoon. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. And um, today is uh, program number 73 on the 30th of November 2023. So we're going to start now and um, I'll have five minutes, a bit of a chat about uh, what's been going on uh, this week. And um, we'll try to finish about 3.10 p.m. So... This week has been an interesting one because um, I finished the, the classes at uh, U3A for the year and uh, also uh, Pino Solazzo's book, uh, Donna Come Dolore, Donna Come Dolce, was published as well. And uh, I also made arrangements this week uh, to have classes in Italian, French, Spanish, world history at um, Tom's my old uh, Insegna Booksellers place, which was sold many years ago, but it's just beautiful now and uh, wonderful to to be there. However, however, you must uh, enrol with me, uh, Tom Padula. Just come to Insegna in North Coburg or just call me on uh, 0403 279 484 or just... Uh, Send me an email, insegna at bigpond.com or tombadulatv at gmail.com. As you can see, I'm an open book and uh, I'm trying to do my best for online to, to say that, uh, you know, I'm very appreciative of uh, the modern technologies and the ability for us to, to use them to express ourselves, being fully aware that we have an obligation uh, to keep it um, real and to keep it, you know, to, to, to remain on a nice level, uh, on a nice level uh, as a peaceful citizen. That's what we want, peace for the world. So how do we achieve peace? I, I think that we can achieve peace if we're much more aware of the history of each nation of the world, because there's been always so much, so many problems of misunderstanding, political, uh, I don't know, arrogance, uh, I, I don't know what to call it, but there's, there've always been wars and there've always been uh, good things happening. And it depends in which part of the world you lived in uh, and which, which times in, in the timeline of history. So uh, this World history uh, program for me means a lot uh, because most historians they go into the details of particular themes or topics. Not not many people really, you know, sort of tend to do the world thing and try to connect it to, with each other, uh, you know, in a program like this one. But you know, I'm sure that uh, now with the help of uh, YouTube, Netflix, we're becoming much more aware of, the, you know, uh, how things are in the world and the great complexity that exists. So it's not easy to really maintain a peaceful coexistence in the world when there are people who just, who may be, who want war for various reasons. Today, Today is lesson number 73. Now, I did finish lessons 1 to 65 uh, where I, when I stopped. I think I stopped and uh, I said that I would do series 2. Uh, so series 1 for me was the, the, the Discovery for European for Europeans by Christopher Columbus of the great continent of America, and you know never forgetting that there were a lot of indigenous people who lived there. So when Christopher Columbus arrived, and we say he discovered America, well he didn't discover it. He went there, he discovered it for exploitation by the Europeans, of course, but. On the other side of the coin is that when the colonials arrive, they start moving things about from the cultural 
heritage of indigenous people so they they you know they're bringing other cultures into the into the continent then then of course because of trade needs uh, there's a great expansion in those lands but i would like to know a lot more about the history of indigenous people uh, from before say christopher columbus so uh, that would be and there are some books about it, uh, and uh, eventually I, I'll get there. But I did, I did arrive to one of these called "Before the Invasion" uh, for Australia, and I have used that book in order to make commentary about um, Indigenous people in Australia from before Captain Cook's arrival, and of course the settlement by Captain Arthur Phillips in 1788. Okay, so that's. 2.11, uh, uh, that's it for the introduction. Now I'm going to uh, go to our friend King Louis XIV in France. <laughs> Here we go. And this time here, uh, he, he becomes an absolute ruler, King uh, Louis XIV, and his, uh, you know, his reign was from 1743, 1643, to 1715, 1643 to 1715. Initially, uh, Mazarin used to, because Louis XIV, when he ascended to the throne, he, uh, what happened to him, he was, he was, um, he was a child. And therefore, he could not, you know, of course, run the country. So someone else sort of advised him, well, took over his his role. But by the time Louis the Fourteenth was 25 years old, he decided, no, I'm going to do this myself. And initially, he was a great, uh, he was a very positive force for France. Uh, he also built the Versailles. Uh, his court was amazing. However, as time went on, power corrupts. He stayed away from Paris. He went to Versailles to live there. Therefore, he did not have a easy access to the people every day and he became an absolute monarch at the age of absolutism. In other words, like a dictator. Whatever I say, he used to say, I am the state. Just imagine that. Now, we're going to continue from last week, and uh, we did um, religious absolutism as well as uh, the, you know, the Court of Versailles and absolute um, political absolutism by, uh, by King Louis XIV. This time here, there was a very able minister called Colbert in, in his court, and he was great for, for trade. You know, he made a lot of money for France. However, Louis XIV was a great, you know, a great guy to spend money. He knew how to spend money, that's for sure. He just had to find it for him. And he'd make sure that he spent twice as much as you earned. <laughs> so Colbert was a most capable minister of economic affairs who had been willed by Mazarin to Louis XIV. So he was a, a student of uh, the great Mazarin. And he was very able. Disagreeable, per, disagreeable personally, Colbert was influential at first in both domestic and foreign affairs, but he lost influence later in Louis' reign because he disapproved of the expensive wars Louis Louis conducted. So he said, you can't keep on, you know, wanting more land and uh, all these wars, uh, they're not good for you. Keep it, keep it real, you know. <laughs> Corbett is noted as a famous advocate of mercantilism, an economic policy that rested on certain assumptions. So what were the assumptions of mercantilism? That a country's prosperity depended on other countries' poverty. So if you've got neighbours who are poor, you prosper because you're rich next door. 
not nice. It's, I, I don't like that one there. But anyway, number two, that a country should keep money within the country and therefore manufacture all the goods it uses, importing only raw materials. So there you are. Uh, that's a lot of people believe that still today, but uh, I'm a child of global economics and I would like to, to see that there is peace in the world so that uh, people can produce and manufacture uh, within their own lanes whatever is best for them and have the ability to sell those products and also import from other places. So all that requires peace in the world. So that was one. It's a limited you know, sort of idea, very close to home, Colbert. That the government should encourage and control industry by regulating prices, quality of goods, wages and other such matters. So he believed in government control of all industries. However, if you got too much, if you got too much, welcome to Libby Petrella. Uh, if you got too much into the details uh, in an economic sense, what happens is that then people lose their creativity. So mercantilism, you know, as under Minister Colbert in Louis XIV uh, reign, uh, did just that. So he was good on, on one hand, but his boss liked to spend money. So he came up with certain rules. But then a control of wages, too much control on his side. So he had an absolutist king and he himself was a very efficient minister. When they first start, that's good. But as you go on and things settle down, it's very hard for then industry to follow strictly to the rule of that are made outside when they see in the place of work that they need to do certain things. And you can't always ask every single detail to a minister. It's just not on. Anyway, Colbert created and supported many industries, but he did it. He protected them with high tariffs so that foreign goods could not compete with them. So imagine if you put high tariffs, and we've had that problem there with China, you know, uh, they, they upped the, the tariffs of import, imports from Australia, and Australia has stopped trading with a, a great partner. But, you know, things do change. Reality then strikes back and says, no, 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 we want it. The best way is what we were doing before. So he also chartered various companies to promote foreign trade, such as the French East India Company and the Dutch had the same sort of thing, which was granted a monopoly of trade with India. So... Colbert's greatest mistake was his no, overly strict and detailed regulation of business. So that's a mistake. When you want to control business from outside and say you've got to do it this way, when you actually don't have the day-to-day. -day. So that is strictness played against him in the end. Even the decreeing the size of feathers in ladies' hats, can you imagine you can only put three head, three feathers in a lady's hat. It's ridiculous. Which has destroyed initiative and healthy competition in industry. Eventually, government support and control of industry and commerce tended to destroy its ability to compete in the world market. So you restrict, you're very strict internally in your nation and then uh, that has a, an effect with uh, the, the, your trading partners. So that's it for this week in terms of uh, Colbert and mercantilism under Louis the Fourteenth. Now, we're going to go on with this. I'll go on with this chapter here, and then uh, maybe I'll take a break and then come back with another exciting uh, 
area because uh, also, uh, in, I think in a couple of uh, lessons, I will be finished with it before the invasion, but I might touch on Australia's colo colonial uh, history and uh, it'll be very interesting. Uh, under Louis XIV, of course, the, he built Versailles, which is an absolute wonderful place to visit. I have not visited it, but I have seen something similar in Caserta in, in near Naples. It's apparently it's very similar because after Louis XIV, a lot of the kings in various nations of Europe tried to copy what he had done. Versailles Palace illustrates the extreme of luxury reached by the French court during the reign of Louis XIV. Situated to the southwest of Paris, the palace and its gardens were designed as a suitable setting for the Sun King and his nobles. While the court lived in splendor, much of the nation lived in squalor. Louis XIV made his nobles live at Versailles instead of their estates, and France thus became a nation of absentee landlords. And that's another, you know, negative side effect by the King Louis XIV. This condition, combined with the extraordinary extravagance of court life, was one of the principal causes of the French Revolution. People, you know, had starved for a few generations. They had enough. Around 1789, especially after the wars of independence in America and the age of Illuminism. Louis himself posed for the portrait, uh, there's a portrait of Louis XIV, by Rigaud. Below is an engraving showing Versailles at the time of Louis XIV, and at the lower right is Versailles at its as it appears today, one of the most notable of the hundreds of rooms at Versailles is the Hall of Mirrors. At the right, a room of rare beauty and the place where, as you will see later, many important peace treaties were signed. I'll show you some of the pictures, why not? Here we go, and then we'll finish, and we'll go to China after this. There you are, that's Louis XIV. That's what he built. Amazing. That's today, if you visit it today, and that's the, the place of mirrors, the Hall of Mirrors. Beautiful. There we are. Yes. Uh -uh. Hey, what have I done? There we are. <laughs> Back again. Okay. From France, King Louis, uh, King Louis place, to uh, China, China. Learning about the Chinese history is very interesting too. It's parallel to the European one and to other parts of the world as well. And today we are doing, what are we doing? We're doing general... Yue Fei, General Yue Fei. Uh, it's, it, the subtitle is A Paragon of Loyalty. Here we go. Yue Fei was a general of the Southern Song Dynasty who fought victoriously against the invading forces of the Jin Dynasty. He studied hard since he was a child and was particularly interested in, st in strategics. He joined the army when he was 20 and became famous for his bravery. Very smart, in the, you know, as a, as a soldier and as a general. UFA wanted to reoccupy the territory of Middle China, which had been occupied by the Jin Dynasty, with all his heart. He wanted that to become part of the Song Dynasty. While he was rather strict with himself, he cared for and cherished the soldiers. It was good, a good general. The UA army led by him was very intrepid and never lost in the battlefield. They never lost. He was always a winner. In, 11, four, in 1140, remember in Europe it's the Middle Ages, 
the Jin army under General Wu Zhu attacked the Southern Song Dynasty. Yue Fei commanded the, the Yue army to fight against them. Wu Zhu had cavalry with special training. The soldiers and war horses were all clad in thick armor called Guai Zi horse. Guai Zi horse. A bit like, you know, the Cavalieri in the Middle Ages. Their horses were, uh, were dressed up and had them to attack the Yue army. Yue Fei found out the weakness of Guai Zi horse and instructed his men to bend and to hack at the horse's unprotected legs. In this way, the Jin troops fell down from the horses and were crushingly defeated. When Wu Zhu heard about the sad news, he burst into a cry bitterly. He said that since he commanded the army to fight, his victories all depended on the Guai Zhu horse, that all was over, that all was over. The Yue army reoccupied a lot of lost territory of the central plains. There was a saying in the Jin army that it is easier to shake a mountain than to shake the Yue army, which means it is easy to push down a mountain, but it is too hard to beat the army led by Yue Fei. What, what, a, <laughs> what a reputation. Later, however, the fatuous emperor Gao Zong of the Southern Song Dynasty made peace with the Jin and asked Yue Fei to retreat from the battlefront. UFA was dismissed and in 1142 executed, executed on a trumped-up trumped charge of Mo Xu Yu, a local dialect meaning perhaps having guilt. Gee, they, after all that, he was, he was killed by his own king. UFA was only 39 years old when he died, when they executed him. That's terrible. Ah, well, well, that's called gratitude, huh? Jin Kang incident. There's an incident here that I'm going to read about. After the Jin conquered the Liao, seeing that the Northern Song was corrupt as well as weakly defended, the Jin decided to take the chance to overthrow the Song dynasty and unify China. In October 1125, the Jin troops came directly from the, from the north and marched towards Dongjing, the capital of the Song dynasty. Emperor Huizong of the Song dynasty was in a panic and did not dare to burden the duty of fighting back. In January 1126, he issued an imperial edict of abdication and let the Prince Zhao Wan, Emperor Qin Zong of the Song Dynasty, succeed the throne and change the reign title to Jin Kang. The next year, the Jin army breached Dong Jing and captured over 30,000 people, including Emperor Hui Zong. Emperor Hui Zong, imperial concubines, imperial relatives, and ministers. The Northern Song dynasty was over, and this was called the Jing Kang incident in history. In the same year, Zheng, Zheng Gu, the brother of Emperor Qin Zong, succeeded in Ying Thiang Fu, today's Shenggu, Henan province, and later moved per ca the capital to, to Lin and today's Hangzhou, Zhejiang province. This is the Southern Song Dynasty in history. General Yue Fei what a, died at the age of 39. Uh, cruelty. Cruelty. Now the next, um, I could not find uh, for the next one, we're going to Africa now, I could not find uh, Eritrea, but I showed you last week the map next to Ethiopia, just to the uh, on the seaside. It's, there's a little piece of land, which is a nation called Eritrea. Now, Eritrea, uh, let me see. I found, you know, I'm using, I'm, I'm going to use uh, this in order to talk about Eritrea. It's a northeast African country 
on the Red Sea. Co on the Red Sea coast. So it's next to the Red Sea. It shares borders with Ethiopia, Sudan and Djibouti. And Djibouti I might do next week. It's a very small piece of land too. Uh, a separate country. The capital city is Asmara. It's known for its Italian colonial buildings like St. Joseph's Cathedral as well as deco structures. Now, Italian... Italian, Egyptian and Turkish architecture in Masawa reflect the port city's colourful history. Not notable buildings here include Sumerian, Sumerian Cathedral and Imperial Palace. Now, I just want to... Now, is Eritrea a rich or poor country? Eritrea is one of the world's poorest country, according to current knowledge. What is Eritrea famous for? Well, uh, for a number of, for a number of uh, reasons, experts found one of the oldest human skeletons in the world. People refer to Eritrea as capital as a new Rome because there are about 400 buildings that Mussolini uh, built over there whilst the Italians were in, uh, you know, had Eritrea as it's one of its colonies. They didn't last long, not even 50 years, but at least they had a, a bit of a, an empire there for a little while, while the southern lands of Italy were struggling. Here we are, spending money somewhere else. The country was one of part of the ancient king, kingdom of Aksum. It's home to a tank graveyard. What else is there? Oh, come on. That's what I like about about online. It's a, everything's available. Eritrea is home to one of Africa's oldest port cities. The ancient port city of Adjulis was part of the Aksumite kingdom from 100 AD to 940 AD. That's after Christ. Situated on the Zula Gulf and the Red Sea, around 59 kilometers south of Massawa, the site has been inhabited since at least the 6th century BC, before Christ. Once upon a time, it would have been one of the most important ports of the, on the Red Sea. Experts believe it had its heyday between the 3rd and 4th centuries AD, followed by a brief revival in the 7th century. Excavations have revealed Roman, Egyptian and Greek artefacts. You can visit the runs of Julius in the present-day city of Zula. Zula. Another port city, Massawa, was once known as the Pearl of the Red Sea. Due to its Ottoman, Egyptian and Italian architecture, the War of Independence badly damaged the city. And that's all happened in the 1960s. I'm going to, find, I'm going to stop there, but you can go to... Uh, you know, find out about Eritrea. Because he said, when you do world history, you want to do something from each one of the continents. Uh, and as I said, there's a lot of, there are a lot of uh, uh, films and series on Netflix. And I'm watching at the moment Cathedral of the Sea, based in um, 13th century uh, Spain. So there's a lot, a lot. The history was after after the uh, the voyages of the great uh, sailors of of history. You know, during the time of Christopher Columbus, that hundred, two hundred years, where all of the globe was more or less visited by uh, by ships from Spain, Portugal, France, England, Holland, etc. But there were a lot of Italian soldiers as well. Uh, uh, sorry, a lot of Italian captains, sea captains, that worked for those great powers. So Italy had its little finger in it, but Italy wasn't Italy until 1861. So Italy was 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 a a split country for centuries, for 1500 years. Anyway, apart from that, we're now we're going to go to before the invasion. And if you remember, last week we talked about. Uh, painting. Paintings. And we got to, let me see, 
we got to uh, sometimes when a large area of the soldier background had to be done, the paint was smeared on by, by hand. I, will, I continue from last week. This is part of the chapter on bark painting. In Aboriginal society, everyone was an artist or craftsman to the best of his ability. There's no her ability here. I'm assuming her ability existed, existed as well. But a few were especially talented, both men and women. Now, the thing is, if you don't uh, tell stories about, you know, how good a person is, whether men or women, then if you exclude one part of humanity, you would exclude one part of humanity. So when we write history, we have to mention uh, both sides. And what I like about today's world is that we're having a lot of uh, sport played by women and in you know national competitions. Fantastic stuff. Okay, let's go on. An individual artist could only choose from certain subjects. A particular clan owned certain sacred designs and this could be painted only by a member of the clan. Very strict. These designs are painted in in secret and to the chanting of sacred songs were not allowed to be seen by women, children and strangers. <laughs> uh, you're talking about prejudice. This is it. The sacred bark paintings were stored in specially built shelters on the ceremonial ground. After the ceremony for which they had been painted was over, they were taken out and burnt. Welcome to Angela Imana. Even as the subject was only semi-sacred, the artist had a limited choice. To him, a water hole was much more than a mere hole in the ground filled with water. Some incident from the life of an ancestral being had happened there, or his totemic animal or bird drank there. Bark paintings reflected these beliefs. If the subject was sacred, often a whole story was painted in symbolic picture signs which could be read only by those educated in that particular myth. Again, knowledge is inward, pushed inward in an inward situation. It doesn't extend out. Uh, so we don't know much really about the centuries uh, lived by the Aboriginal people because of these restrictions that pl placed upon themselves in those small nations. Uh, Australia was never united as, an, as a continent, as a nation. Under the Aborigines, there were hundreds of different groups of people. Uh, you want to call them, I don't know, uh, nations? You can't call them nations. Well, they were more like Neolithic villages or, you know, counties. More like counties, I reckon. Uh, a large area of land that was identified with a particular group of people. That's it. And other people had to ask permission before they go through. Again, permission, permission, permission all the time. Not all paintings were secret. Some pictures showed a shortened version of the myth in which the sacred parts were left out. So, you know... Some parts got out. I painted this, so I'm not sure. This was made for public use. Some of it was made for the use of the general, the general group uh, in, within the Aboriginal community. But against, the artist could only paint the stories he knew through his membership in a totemic group or clan. So he had to be part of a group. In history, in Italian history, uh, in Florence, especially Perugia, all those places there, they had schools, particular schools. You went to a particular master. Same sort of thing here. You know, you, you worked within a group. Some art showed the events of everyday life along the northern coast and, and on the islands. Turtle and dugong hunts were common themes. In Arnhem Land and on, on the Northern Islands, they developed different regional styles of paintings. 
for example, the famous X-ray paintings of the West, which have been mentioned already. They were an ad adaptation of the rich cave art of the region. One or two people or animals were painted in several colours on a plain red background. As well as X-ray painting, the people of West Arnhem Land had another style which showed spirit people hunting, running and dancing. The thin and angular, the figures were painted in a single colour with white or yellow and represented the Mimi spirits which lived in the rocks. To the northeast of Arnhem Land, the art became more complex and colourful. Often the bark sheet exploded with figures, abstract designs or geometric decorations. Uh, thank you, Angela, for the comment. A, board, a border framed the point painted area which was divided into sections. Each section could have been a complete bark painting in itself. So they were pretty large paintings. This style, almost a form of picture writing, described events from myths. Groot Eiland had a third style of painting. While sharing the delicate barring and cross-hatching of the northern eastern style, Groot Eiland artists preferred, preferred plainness. Single figures or small groups were painted against a plain black or yellow background. Figures often outlined in yellow were... Filled, with, filled in with contrasting colour. They used many broken lines of colour instead of cross-hatching or dotting to cover an area. Malva and Bathurst Islands, separated from the mainland, developed their own style. It was a completely abstract form of art. The painted designs were not all like the objects, animals, people and places they represented. There weren't many different colours and the paintings were limited to a few basic visual themes, circles, dots, cross-hatching, barring, sets of parallel lines and a, few, and a few free forms. These styles were the only ones which have survived until now and which can be properly studied. We know very little about the art of Aborigines in southern and eastern Australia. Why? Because, you know, when uh, the colonials arrived, everything much the people in in the southern part in the southern lands were well, uh, ran away or were killed or whatever much of it was lost in the invasion for example no known styles of bark painting survived in tasmania and until recently i thought that tasmanian bridges the last tasmanian bridges with truganini uh, died in the 1860s, that was not even 80 years after the arrival of uh, Captain Arthur Phillips. So it is likely that many styles and types of painting existed, but we will never see them unless, unless discoveries are made. And uh, the Indigenous people of Australia uh, have to, in a way, accept the fact that reconciliation in the way they, they you know, people thought of reconciliation uh, will no longer be possible because uh, most people now in Australia, after, the, you know, uh, after uh, this political decision, will want a united uh, country based on all the groups living in Australia, whether uh, living, living here 60,000 years or arriving just a few years ago, or yesterday for that matter. There's somebody was saying, oh yeah, but uh, what sort of bridges were there 20,000 years ago, 10,000? We don't not really know. And what about, so a lot of questions being asked now. There's a lot of interest as a result, and I think it's a good thing that we keep on supporting the ideas of, um, you know, uh, the Uluru statement, whatever that 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 um, the original people of the land uh, are given their due respect, and we do, we do. But the original people of Australia also have to understand this sort of what I've just read here that they're very insular in their thinking. 
So they they have to expand, open up to the other groups of uh, Australians. And a lot of them have, but, you know, I don't know. Uh, it'll be up to, uh, for each group to decide what they want. All I hear is that you can't do this because the group, you have to ask permission to the Aboriginal people. If I want to write a poem about Aboriginal people, who's going to stop me? No, you've got to ask permission first. No, I just want to do it. I want to be free. Freedom uh, for for all, but respect the culture. But, you know, uh, again, these are complex issues. So we get to the Colonials. And the Colonials, we have a wonderful writer called Benja Patterson. Oh, well, I'm doing all right. It's 2.46. We're supposed to finish at um, 3.10. So we've got a bit of time to, for me to show you some, to read, um, you know, the next poem here. And the next poem, we had an answer to various bards last week. Uh, but I, because it was long, I said I'll divide it into in two lots and I'll continue from where I left off last week. And last week I, I, left, I left off, start from, but a man can easily stand. Where are we? Last week, uh, the last line was, and of course there's no denying that the bushman's life is rough. Okay, I continue. But a man can easily stand if he's built of sterling stuff, though it's seldom that the drover gets a bed of either down, yet the man who's born a bushman, he gets mighty sick of town. For he's jotting down the figures and he's adding up the bills. <laughs> he doesn't want to pay, he doesn't have the money. While his heart is simply aching for a sight of southern hills, then he hears a wool team passing with a rumble and a lurch. And although the work is pressing, yet it brings him off his perch. For it stirs him like a message from his station friends afar, and he seems to sniff the ranges in the centre of wool and tar. And he takes him back in fancy, half in laughter, half in tears, to a sound of other voices and a thought of other years, when the woolshed rang with bustle from the dawning of the day, and the sheer blades were a clicking to the cry of wool away. When his face was somewhat browner and his frame was firmer set, and he fills his flabby muscles with a feeling of regret. Then the wool team slowly passes and his eyes go sadly back to the dusty little table and the papers in the rack. And his thoughts go to the terrace where his sickly children squall and he thinks there's something healthy in the bush life after all. He doesn't like the city, the bushman. But we'll go no more a driving in the wind or in the sun, for our father's hearts have failed us and the driving days are done. There's a nasty, a nasty dash of danger where the long-horned bullock wheels, and we like to live in comfort and get our regular meals. And to hang about the townships suits us better, you'll agree, for a job at washing bottles is a job for such as we. Let us herd into the cities. Let us crush and crowd and push till we lose the love of roving and we learn to hate the bush. And we'll turn our aspirations to a city life and beer and we'll sneak across to England. It's a nicer place than here. But there's not much risk of hardship where all comforts are in store and the theatres are plenty and the pubs are more and more. But that ends it, Mr Lawson, and it's time to say good goodbye. We must agree to differ in all friendship, you and I, and our personal opinion, while they are scarcely worth a rush, but there's some that like the city and there's some that like the bush. And there's no one quite contented, as I've always heard it said, except one favoured person and it turned out to be dead. 
so we'll work out our own salvation with the stoutest parts we may, and if fortune only favours, we will take the road some day and go driving down the river beneath the sunshine and the stars, and then we'll come to Sydney and verme your eyes the bars. <laughs> He mentions Lawson, Henry Lawson. They were friends. Uh, they were friends, uh, Patterson and Lawson. Lawson was uh, a more sort of not as much fun as as Benjo Patterson. Benjo Patterson was a real Australian in many ways. The other one was more English <laughs> in his ways. And, uh, you know... Look, look up Benjamin Patterson. Really, he's got his life story is quite interesting. Henry Lawson. Last time we did uh, we we did a particular story. Uh, on the edge of the plane, it was called. Today we have a new one called Someday. Someday. But I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to read it up to, at last she said. All right, I'll do, I'll do this. So this someday, this Henry Lawson now. The two travellers had yarned late in their camp and the moon was getting low down through the Mulga. Mitchell's mate had just finished a rather race yarn, but it seemed to fall flat on Mitchell. He was in a sentimental mood. He smoked a while and thought and then said, Ah, there was one little girl that I was properly struck on. She came to our place on a visit to my sister. I think she was the best little girl that ever lived and about the prettiest. She was just 18 and then come up to my shoulder. The biggest blue eyes you ever saw and she had hair that reached down on her knees and so thick you could, couldn't span... Couldn't span it with your two hands, brown and glossy, and her skin was like lilies and roses. Of course, I never thought she'd look at a rough, ugly, ignorant brute like me, and I used to keep out of her way and act like a little stiff towards her. I didn't want the others to think I was gone on her, because I knew they'd laugh at me, and maybe she'd laugh at me more than all. She would come and talk to me and sit near me at the table, but I thought that that was on account of her good nature. And she pitied me because I was such a rough, awkward chap. I was gone on that girl and no joking, and I felt quite proud to think that she was a countrywoman of mine. But I wouldn't let her know that, for I felt sure she'd only laugh. When things went on till I got the offer of two or three years' work on a station up near the border. And I had to go, for I was hard up. Besides, I wanted to get away. Stopping around where she was only made me miserable. The night I left, they were all down at the station to see me off, including the girl I was gone on. When the train was ready to start, the, to start she was standing away by herself on the dark, end of the platform and my sister kept nudging me and winking and fooling about but I didn't know what she was driving at. At last she said, go and speak to her, you noodle, go and say goodbye to Eddie. So I went up to where she was and when the others turned their backs, well goodbye Miss Brown, I said looking out my hand, I don't suppose I'll ever see you again for Lord knows when I'll be back. Thank you for coming to see me off. Uh, just then she turned her face to light and I saw she was crying. She was trembling all over. Suddenly she said, Jack, Jack. Just like that and held up her arms like this. Mitchell was speaking in tone of voice that didn't belong to him. And his mate looked up, looked up. Mitchell's face was solemn and his eyes were fixed on the fire. I suppose she gave her a good hug then and a kiss, asked the mate. I suppose so, snapped Mitchell. Uh, there is something a man doesn't want to joke about. Well, I think we'll shove on one of the billies and have a drink of tea 
before we turn in. I suppose, said Mitchell's mate, as they drank their tea, I suppose you'll go back and marry her some day. It's a good, st- good place to stop. And we'll finish off this story next week. Okay. So that's that. Beautiful. So, uh, I suppose, continue with, I suppose. Okay, I made a note here. And we'll continue next week. Next week. Now, next week, I might not be here. So it'll have to be the week after. Uh, I, won't, I won't be here, So, but I even promised that I would be every week. So next week, uh, we'll have to wait. Okay, that doesn't matter. Now, uh, we're going to go to, uh, I think, Fremantle. It was the trip that I took um, with Angela Papola in um, 2022. And I have to... Yes. Yes, I've got it here. Let's, Let's hope that it'll allow me to show it to you. Okay, well, we'll continue from where we left off last week. This is King's Park and Botanic Garden in Perth. Come on, mister. Here, this was the, this was where we left off last week. Yes, here we go. There are, that's where we left off. Now let's hope that this will keep going. Yes. Beautiful, huh? It's called King's King's Garden. When you see a city like this and you look at, you know, Aborigines life, um, Neolithic villages, etc., it makes you think. So we have to come together, this the old and the new. Appreciating each other. There it is. It's uh, a war memorial. My sister Angela talking. And me looking on or looking, doing the selfie. (laughs) I love selfies. Because that means I'm there. That's what it means. The close-ups, that's sitting, you know, from that particular spot. Couldn't resist it. And my sister taking photos. Beautiful, beautiful. Look at that. Amazing work. How many years of hard work? Spectacular, really. There's another one of our friends from uh, the bus. Oh, too many... (laughs) Too many pictures of one thing. Okay. Well, you turn left or right or, you know, there's always something to look at. That's beautiful. Look at this. State War Memorial, lest we forget. And then we could read that, but we won't. I think it'll be time to go. A 
uh, World War II as well is represented here, the various wars. The Queen's Tree, when she came to Australia in 1954, I think. Queen's Tree, too serious there. Beautiful, look at those cards. And the display of glassware, crystal. That's nice, huh? Very nice. Creativity, look at that. Bottle crystal, huh? How did they do that? That's uh, both in English and Italian. It's good history. Look at it, the beautiful bookshop, nicely set up. I love bookshops like this. They do such a good job. Beautiful pictures. My God. Magnificent. Look at that. Oh, this was, I think I bought a gelato in there. Yes. The the King's Park, that's beautiful. <laughs> Good selfie, that one. Back on the bus. How are we going for time? Oh, now we've got a bit more. We've got another, yeah, we've got another seven minutes. It's good. Okay, let's keep going. Now, from here, we went. These are all photos from the bus. I think we're stopping here somewhere else. Beautiful roads, look at that. Look at that, unbelievable, huh? What a beautiful city. Beautiful, Cup of Genia. Uh -huh. Now and then, just a reminder, city centre to Riverside Drive, Barrack Street, Jetty. There.
and boardwalk. So we got, oh, it's beautiful, huh? Look at those buildings. Boardwalk. I think we bought chips here. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah. Photo Ricordo. That's the best one. Now that's a nice one. That previous one was a good one. Is it look good chat did I have one? Yeah, the corona one. <laughs> Good one. Okay, keep going. Uh, some flowers. You need violets, huh? Get the ultimate quokka selfie. I think that's, that's a good one to stop there for next time. The quokka. Okay, let's have a look. There we are, quokka. And then we'll continue next time. Well, I'm so happy to have uh, finished off uh, the world history uh, presentation, really. That's, all, that's what it is. But as you can see, uh, by covering a variety of topics like this, you get the impression that, you know, that it's important for us to be interested in in our world and you know these pics that I take at the time I don't seem to enjoy myself as much because I'm taking photos but I do I do when I take photos I actually am enjoying myself and then the other one and I've been able to work through all this material here and share it with uh, with you so anyone who watches it uh, on uh, I think that my time is not wasted okay uh, thank you very much for coming on what's the time yeah for coming on today there are a lot of people who are um, going to uh, my Facebook page Tom Padula, the one with the circle around. And, uh, you, you know, I put up something every day so uh, you can uh, keep up with what I'm doing. The one thing that I really would like to develop is that um, I called it um, uh, Centre for Adult Centre uh, for Languages and Cultures and also History. A world history but history as well as topics as well so if anyone is interested in joining me uh, I'll I have now the place called Tom's there in, in Brunswick but you if you enroll with me and once I get my six students uh, then I'll run the class that's how I do it uh, I've given my my phone number my email address you know where I am so are you if you are interested uh, please um, you know come and have a good time you'll be able to sing songs learn Italian uh, do lots of different things but what I do I'll run the classes for five weeks 
and then if you like it, you can stay for another five weeks, and then another five, etc. So in other words, the classes are five weeks blocks, uh, and then you can finish off after five weeks, or you can continue for another five weeks. It's up to you. And in terms of time, costs, etc., they will vary according to the number of people that I have in the class. Okay, on that note, this is Tom Vadula from Tom Vadula TV on YouTube and Insania Booksellers. Also, tombadula.blogspot.com. Go to that and look up lessons. There's a lot more information in there. Uh, needing anything for Christmas? Insania.com. Come and spend some money. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you, well, next week I won't, I won't be here, so it'll be the week after. Be the week after. Okay? Ciao. This is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV and Insegna Booksellers.